Good day, Mount Vernon. This is Jack Parker, your superintendent, bringing you a state of the corporation. I want to share some things we've been working on and things that we're going to be working on in the future. So the topics for today, I want to talk about enrollment, our future growth plan, our employee health clinic, employee compensation. I want to do a quick review of our referendum expenditures, as well as provide a behavior update and we're gonna celebrate our professional learning community. So as you can see, we're growing and we're still growing. Um, we have gained about 530 students in the last five years. When you look at the six years combined, we're currently at 4,660 students as of fall ADM day. A lot of people ask about transfer students. Uh, we have a negative net transfer student population right now. We last year, as well as we expect that to be the same this year. Um, by board policy, we are working to decrease our transfer students as our schools start to fill up. That's how it's working for us. Um, where we were at 678 students or 16% of our student population. Um, today, we are 534 transfer students, or um, about 11 and a half percent of our student population. Of those, only 44 are from new families. Of course, once a marauder, always a marauder, and we allow siblings to transfer into our district and we'll continue to do that. But we're able to manage that growth with these policies. So that's an update on our enrollment and transfer students. Next is class sizes, and this data dip is probably about 45 days old. Um, I did it back in November, and at that time, our elementary average class size was 22 and a half. The middle school average class size is 24 and a half, and the high school, 25. I did remove a couple of outliers like the ICE program and things like that, but that includes even the PE classes. So the average class size at the high school um, is 25. Looking at our English as a new language program, um, that is ramping up like it is in all schools in metropolitan Indianapolis. Um, so as you can see, just a few years ago, uh, we were in the low double digits, growing to 54. Last year, we had 165. We are already over the 200 mark for ENL students this year. We're projecting the end of the year to be 226. As you can see, that's gonna to continue to grow and we're looking at um, just in a four more years, almost 600 English as a new language students bringing 33 different languages spoken and from 40 different countries. Um, so we enjoy um, providing that support for the students and um, our team's doing a great job. As you can see, this is our district map. Um, our elementaries are really close to the same size right now. We don't project really any reassignment or anything in the next year or two. Um, Fortville in the red, um, McCordsville in the green, and then of course the purple is Mount Comfort Elementary School, all of Buck Creek Township. Um, so those schools are growing um, about like we expected them to grow. This is our future growth plan, a large piece of it. And as you can see, um, this includes some new property that we purchased. I'm sure anybody who's been near the main campus um, can see the construction that's currently occurring. This is going to be the future Fortville Elementary School. Um, and as most all of you know, in 2025, um, fall of 2025, we are going to remove the fifth grade from all the elementary schools, the sixth grade from the middle school, giving the elementary and the middle school much more room. We're going to take Fortville's elementary students, K through four, over to the new building. And then the current Fortville Elementary School, which is really an intermediate building. It was built as an intermediate building. It's got locker bays, and a large cafeteria, a very large gym. It's got a band room, choir room. Um, we're going to turn that back into an intermediate school in the fall of 2025. The other thing I want you to see is that um, we have a new transportation center coming online. That's supposed to come online right at spring break just this year, and we're really excited about that. Um, a little piece that's interesting, you can see down at the bottom, um, this is where our current uh, bus barn and maintenance and transportation center is. It's our plan to, to raise those, to tear those down, 
and allow us to construct this additional road and much needed parking for the middle school. Uh, we plan to do that um, yet uh, before next school year. Um, our hopes are to be able to start um, using this drive for parents to drop their students off in front of the middle school and then that bus lot that was constructed last year will actually be able to be used for buses so we're pretty excited about those changes now i told you this building is getting torn down not only is it the maintenance and transportation center it's also our employee health clinic now as luck will have it we've um, have a verbal agreement right now and we're moving forward with formal contracts um, to move our employee health clinic which is managed by Hancock Health, an amazing partner for our schools. We're gonna move our employee health clinic to the McCordsville um, Hancock Health Campus. Okay. So that's exciting news. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about our salary increases for our staff, starting with teacher. Um, we've developed this study and what we've done is we've identified the six school corporations who share a border with Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon would be the seventh school, right? And then we threw in Eastern Hancock, even though we don't share a border with them, but we felt like it was good for this study. And so we have eight schools that we're looking at. We're one of the eight. And on each of the graph graphs I'm gonna show you, Mount Vernon is the dashed line. So when you look at salary increases for four years, um, we were doing pretty well and we're continuing um, to work really hard to provide as much possible salary increases as we can. This is the four year. If you add all four years together, Mount Vernon is the second column from the right. Um, the only school district that beat us is Hamilton Southeastern. Uh, I will say they have an operating referendum that's more than ours and it's 100% for staff salaries. Um, if you'll remember our operations fund cliff, our operating referendum um, was much different for different purposes. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit, but we're very proud of, of the work we continue to do. Now, the other thing I wanna talk about is teacher starting salary. Um, in this comparison group, we were third from the bottom. Now we're fourth from the top and we continue to work toward that. That data is as the fall of 2022. I grabbed this data off DLGF's website and they don't have it updated for December of 23 yet. And of course, um, I'll update that when I, when I get that data. But I wanna tell you, we are continuing to work on that. Now, here's the thing. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about retention rate. Um, teacher retention rate, it's not very good for almost all schools and we own that. And we're working really hard to provide as much pay and benefits and um, help make Mount Vernon the best we can so people want to work here. Um, but it's really hard and we're gonna continue to do that. Um, I will say we have beat the state legislature every time. They give us new money. We are able to organize things and pinch some pennies and give even more money than the state gives us in additional money. And we're gonna to continue to do that. When you do look at our teacher retention rate, um, that's how it has been in comparison to the other schools. In the fall of 2022, we actually had the highest teacher retention rate. Still, it's a lot of work we have to do and we're gonna to continue to work on that. I wanna talk about our classified staff. We are um, exceptionally proud of the great folks that support our work every day and over the last five years when you combine the last five years all together on average we have given given the classified employees um, almost 40 percent additional pay than what we gave them six years ago so that's five years of growth um, and we want to continue to do that as well and that's a big celebration let's talk about the referendum a little bit i am um, I shared with you, I wanted to give you a, a, an update on that. Um, when we um, passed the referendum in May of 2022, um, we were able to start collecting dollars in 2023 is when we began collecting those revenues. Um, we were able to advance some of our referendum dollars to pay um, pretty quickly. Um, but I also want you to know that because of uh, the increase in property taxes from reassessment from 21 that's paid in 2022. 
um, it kind of uh, caused some concern in a lot of people and our, certainly our state legislators. So they took action last spring, we weren't expecting it, um, and the action they took was to limit the growth of our operating referendum. Now, we have an eight year operating referendum for 17 cents and we expected it to grow each year because our assessed valuation is growing. So we have planned on it growing. Quite frankly, if it, we didn't think it was going to grow, our assessed valuation would grow and our net proceeds from a 17 cent referendum would grow. We would have just asked for 19, 20, 22 cents, something like that. But we only asked for what we needed, which was 17 cents. And unfortunately, now that has been capped. So um, our 17 cent referendum is scheduled to be about a 15 and a half cent referendum. Um, we're doing okay because we're growing with our AV, um, but it is something we have to pay very close attention to. And please understand that operating referendum was really about making the operations fund whole. Those of you that were here a few years ago know that story really well. However, we have been able to use 41% of our referendum revenues for pay. And of course, the other 59% uh, excuse me, is supporting our operations fund. Um, taking care of our tax cap laws and of course the loss of our increment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about student behavior. Um, it's difficult times. Um, the, the, the range of needs continue to be more and more diverse for our students. Um, the pandemic certainly threw some fuel to something that was already uh, becoming more and more difficult for us. Um, especially in those primary grades. We've been working really hard to support them. So we started that systems approach. It really started last school year. Um, we started monthly administrator training meetings and we still do those um, to this year. Um, we added staff, especially behavior staffing, a board certified behavior analyst, um, a behavior coach. We have had a behavior coach, so she's not new and she's amazing. Um, we added um, some life coaches, as well as five registered behavior techs. We added six behavior techs that are just, all of those folks are doing great work in the schools. And then we also developed a 53 program. And basically that just means students with disabilities and an IEP who um, can't function in a school building need to be educated outside the school building. In the past, we were able to pay tuition for them to go to other places. Those other places have closed um, to outside folks because they're so busy with their capacity. So we haven't had places to send folks for a while, but we're building our own. We built our own 53 program for elementary this year. It's already started. It's going great. Um, the, the team in there is really helping those students a great deal. And we also have posted, um, we're gonna build a secondary program as well. Um, so we posted a position for a 53 program for secondary and those are housed in our building. Um, of all of these positions, I don't know, there's 15, 18, something like that. Most all of them we hired as recently as last year and this year, as well as the additional programs for essential skills and FISH programs in our schools, so now that all the schools have them. We put a lot of resources in that, and it's starting to pay off. It's still difficult, um, but we're giving kids what we need. We're giving staff support the best that we can, and um, we're really proud of the work that our team is doing, and they are certainly superstars. The last thing I want to talk about is the celebration with professional learning communities. Gosh, we kicked off this school year by sending a large group of people to St. Charles, Missouri for the PLC at Work Institute. Um, we really believe that all students can learn at high levels. And when you have kids for 13 years, um, you should be able to see growth each and every year. Can we be just a little bit better with student learning each and every year? Huge celebration. We've increased capacity. We're focusing on the five behaviors of a PLC, which is multiple levels above collaborative lesson planning, um, focusing on student learning and using our essential learnings and common assessments. Um, right now, grades K through eight have 243 essential learnings with common formative assessments for math and English language arts. That's about 14 per subject per grade level, which is it's about right, that's right in the pocket. Um, and we are just so proud of the work our curriculum collaborators do to move that living, breathing document forward each and every year. The high school is a 
bit of a different animal. They have so many singletons and it's just different. But I'll tell you, I've looked at Principal Tharp's um, tracking sheets and I am absolutely astounded um, at the great work the high school is doing with PLCs and building those CFAs for their essential learnings. And that's a huge celebration. And I just wanna say thank you to all of our staff who's focusing on what's best for kids and focusing on all of them learning at high levels. So I'll stop there. I hope you appreciated the videos. I wanna talk more about some of these things. If you wanna talk about other things, I'm available to chat. I hope you've had a great start back to the school year. And thanks again for watching the video. Have a good day.